stakeholders to report the full picture. If you have people who are fleeing, why are they fleeing? Why are they fleeing? That's very important. I've been adversely affected, you know, affected rather. Um, the, uh, uh, RLP talks about people who, have, uh, who are fleeing sexual violence. Um, they've told us that women and children suffer disproportionately as a result of conflict and also as a result of migration. That being said, um, I would also like to say that uh, we can use journalism uh, as a tool to deliver justice, but it cannot is. Uh, one of my favorite authors and investigative journalist, Michelle Arong, in the uh, users do not disturb, um, to advocate for the protection of someone's human rights and the lives of people who are at risk all the time. And so we could, we, let's put in the work is all I can say. The information is out there. Let's use it. Let's interpret it. Because I know that different entities collect administrative migration data, but they do that for different reasons. So you must understand that if you're collecting information from the Ministry of Internal Affairs, um, they do predominantly migration control. And you should have that context. If you're collecting data from OPM, UNHCR, you know that this is from a protection perspective and a refugee and persecution perspective. So then you must put that into context. If you're collecting data from ILO, you're going to remember that that's a labor, that's a labor lens in there. You know. So let's share. In terms of internal, in terms of internal mobility, you also know that uh, people in Uganda have been forcibly displaced. Uh, internally as well, and a lot of efforts are being put into play. Currently, the main reason that people uh, in Uganda are forcibly displaced, but there's a, there's a, there's a, um, it's not a new phenomenon, but it's more noticeable now. The adverse effects of clinically from Dr. Chibita, um, a young girl named Husna. Uh, it has been surviving on agriculture. Her and her family have been surviving on agriculture in Chivoga district. Uh, but because of the adverse effects of climate change, they have uh, three consecutive for a job. Um, if someone is doing a research and they um, interact with her, they will, fight, they will assess and imagine that, sh imme immediately conclude that she's uh, moving because of labor. Husna will come to the city and do a casual job uh, for some time, and then if, it, if that fails, she will go to the United Arab Emirates to look for a job. And then we will then still categorize her as someone who is looking for labor. But the initial reason as to why she left was because of the adverse effects of climate change. And so that's something that as government we're trying to pay attention to. And, and that's why Ministry of Gender, Labor and Social Development is also trying to put efforts uh, to regularize uh, uh, labor, labor mobility because uh, many of the Ugandans who go abroad remain at risk without protection because it's out of uh, the well-regulated uh, confines of, of migration. So that's what I can say about that, and that's what I can say about the narrative. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peggy. When I say it's a conversation, it's not a conversation of people on this table. Uh, Diane, if you could just help me uh, kindly to move the microphone so that we can involve um, the other people in this conversation as well. So it's time for uh, the, particip the other participants to ask a question Okay, as, uh, as um, Diana moves with the microphone, Susan uh, will have a I just want minute. to say something on framing stories. Yeah. And I want to share my experience as one of the people who has been very instrumental during uh, the trainings of different stakeholders. I think the whole aspect of framing stories comes with bias and attitude. As someone who has trained a number of stakeholders, including the police, the judiciary, immigration, journalists, there is a negative perception. When you start the training and just ask, what is your perception of refugees? Everyone will just give a negative answer. Why are they in this country? Ugandans are also suffering. We need employment. They need to go back. When does their asylum stay? So you see there's already a negative attitude. So as you start the training, you must be able to convince these people that these are people who are here beyond their control. They, they don't choose to be refugees in this country. So uh, for me, I mean, it takes time. There's a negative perception. People are struggling in the country. Ugandans are also struggling. Ugandans are also undergone conflict. So people have that bias, and it has taken us so many years to try and train a number of stakeholders to make them understand why Uganda is hosting refugees. So even with the journalists, I mean, at times when they report, and, and you're seated there, and you're like, what? Is this really? 
you realize that actually there is need to speak to these people to make them understand because that is the negative perception. So it's not an easy thing. It will take lots of time for people's attitude to change. It's a process. Just like when we had the, the bombings in 2010, Somali refugees suffered a lot. And what was being reported on media about Somalis was negative. These are all terrorists. So it, it takes time for the people to understand. It's, time, it's high time for stakeholders and, and the rest of us to understand that refugees contribute a lot to the economic growth of this country. They are not just here to exhaust the resources, but they contribute a lot to development and growth of the country. Thank you very much, Susan. So we are going to hear from the participants and then for members who are on this table, each one of you will have a minute at the end. And the question is, what's the way forward? How do we move on from this chaos uh, to, to improve things? Yes, Mr. Semakula. Okay. Thank you so much, Professor Monica Chibita, for the, uh, your presentation. You are spot on in a number of areas. I also want to thank the members on the panel for their wonderful uh, deliberations. Now, allow me to start from the point. I have about three issues to talk about. I um, think... Because of the time factor, we have members joining us in about 10 minutes online. Okay. I would request that we take the most important okay, okay. of the three. One, I think uh, we are fundamentally wrong from the beginning when it comes to define who a migrant is. Uh, for example, when you mentioned the word migrant from the African perspective, uh, is someone who is actually leaving Africa to go to the West and, and work, something like that. And even from the uh, perspective of the uh, people in the West, yeah. is someone who is coming uh, from Africa to go to the West and work. Yet we've got uh, 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 people coming from the West and other uh, developed countries coming to work uh, in Africa or in any other uh, developing countries or uh, uh, low developing countries. And we fail to understand that. So I think we need to do something to understand what actually uh, this is. And in terms of reporting, that actually fundamentally affects the way we report about uh, this, the, 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 the migrants. Okay. So we need to understand that. And allow me just to point at one particular aspect of... Uh, uh, Which is the journalists and uh, uh, the journalists and the reporting generally reporting about uh, migration. I think there is need for uh, these organisations involved in handling uh, migrants and refugees to partner with uh, media houses, but also in terms of recruitment. I think that it is important that they recruit communication experts who can actually write stories and make sure that these stories enter the newsrooms. I think there is a gap there. So you recruit some but who cannot write a story, and then you think that journalists are going to come from New Vision or Monitor and yeah. cover you. I think there's a problem there. Thank you, Mr. Semakula. Thank you. Um, Ms. Kajingo. Thank you very much, and for your uh, great insights. We are grateful as a class of um, masters for strategic communications. Now, Uganda um, is always commended for being the friendliest, most hospitable country, and of course, no wonder uh, we are among the top five top destinations of refugees. But this is not by mistake. It's because our leaders in Uganda have for years, for decades, been telling us that Africans are our brothers. And so um, many of us, many of our homes in the last 30, 40 years have hosted refugees. Um, like many of you have said, refugees who um, get hosted in Uganda and not um, assimilate. They, they are enabled to, to produce food, to engage in income generating activities. I see tailoring in Bidibidi. I see in Chaka students, um, refugees, students going to school. So I, my, my concern is that if it does you do a great job in um, in enabling refugees to settle here and support them, I think we need to go beyond that and address the push, um, the push factors. You saw our recent attack in Somalia, where the country is divided. Of course, it's very regretful, but we salute our brothers and sisters who perished. But it, it is the correct thing to tackle terror at its source. And when you tackle terror at, at its source, you do not only protect uh, people and lives of Ugandans um, from terrorist attacks, but you're also dealing with the push factor 
that would get for migration Somalis and mobility to migrate to Uganda. Okay. And as you know very well, Chisenyi is almost a little Mogadishu. Um, Kansang and Kabalagala has become a little Asmara. Sudanese are already here. So, yes, we are doing great receiving these people, but we need to address the push factors. Regarding journalists. Yes, as you conclude, sir. Often journalists uh, receive the beating, um, but it is up to us, um, communicators, who are charged with building these narratives to ensure we first we tell compelling stories that can earn coverage, but also engage journalists so that we are on the same page. When Professor Chibita was beginning her keynote, she began it with a very compelling story of the experience of Fatuma, if I remember the name correctly. It's one thing I will never forget from here that, you know, the way we tell our stories does matter. Thank you very much. Otherwise, we are very grateful as a class for inviting us and for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Sarah. I'm taking two more comments, and there is a hand behind there. Uh, and, and then finally, Prof. Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate all the speakers, everything that has been shared. And I appreciate, uh, she's Madame Susan from uh, the Refugee Law Project. You know, I have something really bothering me. If as a country have the capacity to host these refugees, I don't know. I want more enlightenment on that. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. And then finally, Prof. Um And I just wanted to raise the issue that certainly, or maybe also in Uganda, it's the same case as we observe in Europe, that uh, on the one hand side, you, you have a certain perspective on the issue of migration in the media, in the public debate, but then the perspective changes if you ask people for their personal experience they made with refugees and migrants. And uh, this can really um, be totally different. And um, they might have very positive personal experiences with migrants and refugees, but the overall tone in the public discourse is rather negative. Uh, this is also something very interesting maybe to, to tackle uh, in the course of our project. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Um, uh, professor, uh, <laughs> Dr. Imokola, I would love to only add one, one voice to that as yes. my contributor. Yes, uh, I felt it was necessary to speak because I work with refugees so much. Okay. So. Um, I only wanted to know, I heard a lot from the speakers here on the panel, and they, I only want to know how much civic engagement do you do? Because it's evident some of your projects do work and some do not work. Remember, there is a lot of porous borders, and these, I come from Arua, so these refugees live with us in homes. They just come, because you speak the same language, they come and settle. So there is no accountability, and there is nothing that follows. And then also, the injustices that happen to them in the camps especially the officers of the OPM. They, those should be issues to be investigated. Okay. And when they speak to the refugees, they don't open up. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. Members, we are each going to have a minute. Uh, if you have a question directly to you, please answer it. But also, what's the way forward? How do we improve the communication and reporting of mobility and migration? Mr. Walusimbi. Somebody was asking whether the country has the capacity to host refugees. I I can answer uh, partially, but yeah, also OPM can add to this. Yeah. We do have the capacity. Unfortunately, uh, the, 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 the donors, or maybe the world entirely, has a hangover. They, the, the, there are a lot of uh, crises happening. Uh, last year, Ukraine did us a very uh, huge disservice. Uganda remained underfunded. We're among the 12 most underfunded countries. Uh, that I, I'm talking about the UNHCR operation, but the capacity... And yet we are the fifth in terms of the numbers we are hosting. Uh, yes, exactly. So you can see the contradiction. But uh, there's a lot of money that went to Ukraine. Uh, now there is uh, Sudan that needs over uh, $300 million. You know. uh, here we need about, uh, if we are to work on everything, every need, we would need about uh, $343 million. Okay. Uh, but for now we, yeah... What's the way forward for us? Um, 
Okay, uh, the way forward, uh, somebody talked about uh, organizations recruiting as many journalists, I agree with you. And unfortunately, many are leaving newsrooms now. You hear they are joining organizations. It's, uh, uh, it's for this reason that organizations have to tell stories. They have to ensure stories are framed properly. Uh, to Mr. Kaida, the newsrooms have to build uh, uh, a space uh, where, ref uh, where reporters can specialize. Yeah. If I were to, to look for a reporter who specializes in humanitarian reporting, there are very few. It is media outside Uganda that sets the narrative, and then journalists see a read online, and then they, they are like, okay, there is this happening in Uganda, so they pick up the phone, and we'll call Frank at UNHCR to follow up. Okay, thank I you. I find it strange. And lastly, uh, journalists, have to, we have to engage them um, to teach them a con uh, communication ethics okay, in thank line you. Uh, with uh, reporting about uh, forcefully displaced people. Thank you very much. Mr. Kaira? Way forward in, in three areas. One, training. I liked the idea that so many of these organizations are training journalists. That is great because uh, it is very vivid that we have skills gap in many of our newsrooms. So if we bridge that gap, then we are moving towards changing the narrative. Okay, so then you can two, exchange the contacts after this. The, program, the project is also here to exactly. close the gaps. Great. Two, sharing clear information. Uh, there was a debate about data. So if you, I, as a journalist, I receive from different sources and the data doesn't, you know, connect. So I end up getting confused and I drop the story eventually. So we need to uh, make that smooth. I like the submission which uh, Dr. Med about okay. that. Okay. Then lastly That's is about partnerships. We need to emphasize partnerships because uh, 